Don't be thinking your ambition is corrupt. You know, because that's part of the message. Now, human beings, we're a cancer on the planet. We're headed for an environmental apocalypse. The entire historical structure is nothing but atrocity, et cetera, et cetera. Anyone with any ethical aim whatsoever is just going to pull back. You don't want to manifest any ambition, support the patriarchal structure, exploit the environment. You've got to crush yourself down. You shouldn't even have any children. It's like, no. There's no excuse for that. There's zero excuse for that. I saw a professor at, at an event, something like this. He came out and trumpeted this bloody, environmentally friendly house he built. And, you know, fair enough, man. It was a, it was a pretty interesting house. But not everybody had the $4 million that, that it took him to build it. And I'm not criticizing his money, even. It's like, he's had some money. Good for him. He built a house. Okay. But then to trumpet that as a moral virtue, well, you're pushing it there. And then he came out to all the kids and he said, you know, my wife and I decided that we were only going to have one child. And I think that's one of the most ethical things we could have possibly done. And I would strongly encourage you to do the same. I thought, you son of a bitch. You get up in front of these young people. A lot of these kids were uh, children of first generation immigrants from China. And, and he showed all these images, you know, of these terrible factories in China, these endless rows of sterile mechanism that were subordinating all the Chinese people to this terrible, you know, capitalist uh, machine. And I thought, you don't understand. Half the audience is looking at those factories and thinking, that's a hell of a lot better than struggling through the mud under Mao, buddy. And so... He, I don't know where he thought he was, but to come out in front of all those kids and basically tell them that the whole human enterprise is so goddamn corrupt that the best thing they could possibly do is limit their multiplication. And to think of himself as a scholar and an educator was just, I did say something, by the way. It was rather uncomfortable and he stomped off the stage. But that's no message for young people. That's no, there's no excuse for that. And you think, well, I, you know, we're going to destroy the planet. We have to do this. We have to demoralize the youth to be ethical. It's like, yeah, really, that's your theory you're going to demoralize young people to be ethical that's your theory it's like you should go home and think about that for like a year and i'm passionate about this you know because you have no idea how many people that's killing you have no idea i see people everywhere all over the world is so demoralized especially young people especially Young people with a conscience, because they've been told since they were little that there's nothing to them but corruption and power. It's like, how the hell do you expect them to react? The smaller the game, the less the gain at the top. But we expand the games continually with technology, and, and recording is an excellent example of that. And so I guess what we hope is that we produce enough new games so that everybody can win at something. But we're still, we're still funneling a tremendous number of resources to people at the top of whatever the game is, especially as these games become big. So, yes. and you see that, you see that particular, well, it's really obvious with money and people complain continually about the top 1%. But the problem is, is that there's a book called Big Science, Little Science that was written in about 1962. And the author escapes me at the moment, but he did exactly the same sort of analysis for the scientific literature. It's exactly the same story. So hyper dominance of a tiny minority of people. And so there's a natural, it's, it's something like positive feedback loops too, isn't it? Because, and I've noticed this as I've become more famous, I suppose, is that you get known and some more people know you and some more people are likely to attend to you. And then more people are willing to talk to you because you have an audience. And so that drives the expansion of the audience and your connection network grows at the same time and you have more resources. And so it just, it's a pause, it's a bunch of positive feedback loops moving upward. I mean, I studied entrepreneurial success as a researcher for quite a long time too, because one of the personality factors that predict entrepreneurial ability is this trait openness, which is essentially creativity. And what defines creative thinkers in part is, so here's a simple creativity test. And it, it actually is reasonably predictive of creative capacity, both in terms of originality of thought and creative productions as assessed by experts. How many uses can you think of a, for a brick in three minutes? You gotta write them down. Or even how many four letter words can you think of in a minute that start with C? That'll be correlated at about 0.3 or 4 with your creativity, depending on how it's measured. Very simple test. And what seems to happen is that creative people, when they think of one idea, the probability that that will 
trigger an associated idea is higher, especially a distally associated idea. So that likely means that creative people have more erroneous ideas as well. And then they have to, you know, what would you say, edit them and select. But one of the things that makes creative entrepreneurs successful is that they produce a large variety of creative products and then they throw them out in the marketplace and most of them fail, but you just need one to hit that Pareto point and then you're successful. So you throw, you know, it's, you throw some, what do you do? Throw a mess at the wall and see what sticks essentially. And most entrepreneurs before they're successful have had a very large number of failures because even if you're intelligent and creative, the probability that you'll build a product that's actually timed for the market is extremely low. So, well, what do you do? Well, you create more and that's what happens. That's what creative people are essentially biologically predisposed to do. So after Cain and Abel comes the flood. And that's no accident. The narrative placement of those stories is definitely no accident. It's unbelievably sophisticated from a literary perspective, a philosophical perspective, theological perspective, existential perspective. One form of temptation is the nihilistic chaos that's symbolically represented by the flood, right? It's the proliferation of sins. And sin is a word, both its Greek and its Hebrew derivation are related to archery. So the Greek derivation, I hope I haven't got this wrong because I know there are Greek scholars in this audience. So um, the, the, the word is derived from the Greek word hamartia, which means to miss the mark. And it's an archery term. It's a, it's a, lovely, I, it's a lovely notion to know that because to sin, therefore, means to miss the target, which implies that it has something to do with aim or the lack thereof. I love that. I think it's so apt. And the derivation of the word sin from the Hebrew source actually relies on the same imagery. And so to sin is to aim wrong or to miss the mark. And there's a variety of ways you can miss the mark, right? Don't aim at all. That's a good one. Assume there is no such thing as aim. Assume all aims are equal. Well, you sin, you miss the mark. What can happen? Well, one way is you can descend into a kind of nihilistic hopelessness. And that's not... You can understand that. You know, you meet people in life whose lives have been so hard. You, know, you hear their stories. They've suffered so much. And they're bitter and they're hurt and they're resentful. And you think, oh my God, it's no wonder you're bitter and hurt and resentful. I mean, look what you've gone through. And, but you also notice that their bitterness and their resentment and their hopelessness and their chaos and their anxiety, it's not helping. Right? It's worsening the problem. It's not making it better. And I'm not saying that people can always resist that. But I, I, I have certainly seen that it's not helpful. But I, and I've also met other people, you know, who have had stories equally catastrophic. Sometimes more catastrophic. Sometimes so catastrophic, you can't even believe that they survived. Who are not embittered or made resentful by those experiences and who continue to aim up. And so that makes a mockery of the, of the, of a kind of casual determinism, right? Is that you end up chaotic, nihilistic, hopeless, anxious, etc merely as a consequence of the unbearable tragedy of your life. Because if that was the case, then everyone who had a series of unbearable tragedies, which, by the way, will be almost all of us in one way or another, at one time or another, would end up in that ca catastrophic chaos that, that once, that if manifested broadly enough in a society, produces a flood of, that ends everything. We have this idea, it's not a good idea, and it's certainly an idea for which religious people are often pilloried, that faith means the sacrifice of reason and the willingness to believe things that are patently not true. And when religious people debate scientists, they're often sort of hung out to dry on exactly those presuppositions, their willingness to accept on principle propositions that seem on the face of them impossible. I don't think that's what faith is at all, in, in some fundamental sense. I think faith is a form of courage. You know, if you're hurt by life, and you will be, it's understandable that you might react in a nihilistic and hopeless fashion and become anxious and depressed and cynical and bitter and all of that. Uh, that's a bad pathway. And I think part of what helps you through that is faith. And, and part of that faith is that it's incumbent upon you and actually in your best interest and everyone else's to maintain faith in the fundamental goodness of existence, including your own, despite the evidence to the contrary. Right? Because you can draw conclusions from suffering in two 
ways, right? One is that you have a duty and perhaps the capability to transcend the suffering and still serve the good, or you can derive the conclusion that life is so unbearable that it would be best terminated, which is the conclusion that Goethe as Mephistopheles derives, for example, in Faust. He says, well, the world is rife with suffering, and it's so unbearable that consciousness itself, all being, should cease to exist. That would be better. Nothing is better than something if something is rife with suffering. And you can derive that conclusion, and you'll be driven to it in some of the farther reaches of your life when terrible things happen to you. But I would say, faith is the courage to not take that path despite the evidence that that might be justified.